Risk causes uncertainty, but it is part and parcel of the investment environment and assumed by all investors. Our awareness of risk changes that depending on our most recent market experiences. So how should we deal with the uncertainty as investors? Tonight we'll be delving into the issue of investment risk, clarifying what it means and how investors should deal with it. This is a part of a two-part series and next week we'll be finding out more about robust ways to make investment decisions. That with our special guest joining us from Cape Town, Linda Eads, a senior analyst at ReCM. Also with me are Ying and Yang uh, strategist, Kwebi Lakranji strategist at Clickers Gray Investment Managers and Roland Rousseau equity strategist at Absa Capital. Welcome to you both. Let's uh, get straight into uh, the topic. And uh, Linda, I'm going to throw straight to you because the, the purpose of this is to take a look at a paper that you've wrote, uh, written rather, around risk and uh, talking about investing in the face of uncertainty. So very broadly, just talk to us about uh, the overall view in terms of the one that you're trying to put forward by the paper. The premise of the paper is really that with investing you are dealing with the future and unfortunately the future is uncertain and you're having to make decisions which um, you know are predicated on what's going to happen in the future and you have two choices you can try and forecast the future uh, but there are a whole lot of issues with, with that which we can go into or you can accept that you can't forecast the future and build a portfolio which is robust enough to withstand uh, whatever happens in the future and still deliver decent returns to investors. Mm -hmm. So that's pretty much bottom line right now and I suppose one of the uh, great uh, writers on, on risk and one of the great uh, kind of strategists and authors in investing world is Charles D. Ellis. He wrote that book uh, Winning the Losers Game. It's got many editions out right now. So, so what was the premise that he was trying to get through uh, for, through that book? Well I think in order to understand uh, markets better you have to understand what risk is and you need to be able to define it. Often the definition of risk uh, when you speak to the academic community and maybe more importantly you look at people that write textbooks, the definition of risk is very very different to the, the definition of risk that you potentially should see out in the market. You know, ultimately, risk should be the absolute loss of capital. The fact that you could never, never make back that kind of, you know, the capital that you've lost. And maybe that's a starting point for understanding what risk is, and defining uh, and defining what risk is. As you quite rightly pointed out, Charles Ellis speaks about the market as being a loser's game, and the loser's game at the end of the day is a game where even a random portfolio and even a random bunch of assets could potentially outperform. The benchmark, or yeah. so the, the the so to speak market, and this is what Charles Ellis speaks about in the losers game. And it's not a game of skill; it is a game where potentially random events can uh, can influence the market. And one has to take that into consideration when one is a fund manager. How do you define risk? There are different types of risk. Generally, there are two broad categories. There's what we call risk factors. In other words, those are low quality risks. They are things that are unavoidable, so currencies and earthquakes and these kind of things will impact the volatility of our portfolio uh, and we just have to live with them. Um, then you get uh, what is called risk premium or higher quality risks. In other words, it is worth taking that risk because you're going to get a return for that higher risk. So something like value investing is a, you know, a, a, a process where you are trying to buy shares that are cheaper than the market and we find that uh, low PE shares, low price to book companies tend to outperform. You don't necessarily need skill to do that. You can mechanistically capture to some extent the value premium uh, as well. So you, you, you want to expose your portfolio to high quality risks that give you a return but that are lowly correlated as well. Mm -hmm. Linda, do we have uh, or do investors at large have a healthy respect for risk and, and what would a healthy respect for risk mean in investing to you? I think uh, there's a lot of confusion around the concept of risk and you know you've just discussed a few definitions of risk and um, the problem is that uh, by and large the market defines risk as volatility um, which we don't think is a very accurate measurement of risk um, we think as Kobe said that risk is really the risk of permanent capital loss and when you think about it that way it really does differentiate how you make investments um, because as Kobe said investing in a, is a loser's game it's actually not about picking the winners so much as it is about avoiding the losers and that's what value investing is all about mm -hmm. so so why is that talk to us about why is it so important to ensure that you avoid those big capital losses as opposed to trying to pick the next uh, big uh, and I'm trying to think of a capitec or whatever you know what stock has run in the past decade or so 
Well, for two reasons. First of all, um, minimizing your losses, um, and especially with regards to permanent capital losses, but also to a certain extent downside risk, uh, so any losses in your portfolio, minimizing it allows you to compound off a higher base. And we know that investing, the most powerful force in your favor is actually compounding. And the very simple example, which is often trotted out, is if you have 100 Rand and you lose 50%, you're at 50 Rand, you have to make back 100% to get back to your starting point. So avoiding losses always puts you on a better position to compound from that point forwards. Um, then you've got to differentiate between permanent capital loss and when you pick a winner, uh, we define winner often by stocks that have performed incredibly well. And you know, unfortunately, the tendency of the market is to go well above what that stock is actually worth because it becomes very popular and there's euphoria, etc. Now, if you are with a winner, and it happens to correct to a more reasonable level from those very high prices, that is a permanent loss of capital which you will never again recover. And that is what you want to avoid at all costs, which is very different to the temporary loss of capital that you get sometimes value investing in cheap stocks, which become cheaper in the short term, but ultimately recover back to what you think they should be. Mm -hmm. You see, this is a very important concept. If you talk to the popular media, you open up any business newspaper, you have a look at, 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 at most shows, as a matter of fact, if you just watch TV, you watch business TV, it's about how to pick the next winner. It's about which companies are going to outperform. It's about the forecasting and the ability for a business to create earnings. And often we take the analyst community and we, and we, and we kind of cover them in gold when they get their, their earnings numbers right on a 12-month basis and as an, on a forecasting basis. But the important point here is maybe we shouldn't be so much focused on picking a winner. Maybe we should be a lot more focused on avoiding the losses. Because, and I mean, this goes back, I mean, two, three weeks ago, we actually spoke about the 10 rules of investing by Alistair Martin. This was one of them. He said, all the good work in a very good portfolio can be undone by one bad holding. Yeah. Um, and this is exactly what this point is. And I don't see many people talking about avoiding losses. Lots of people are talking about picking winners, but not a lot of people are we talking about We talked about, about it losses. on WealthQuest, and we're <laughs> talking about it now. Let's talk about analysts uh, and Roland, your view on how uh, predictable the future is and uh, what uh, forecasts tell us and how they're built into stock prices. Well, Linda spoke about two types of investors. I'd like to say that there are three types of investors. You, you firstly get the, the forecasters. So through analysis and research, they believe that they can predict, in other words, the earnings growth, the GDP of the country, and benefit from that. And then, as Linda pointed out, you get a second group of investors, which are called, let's call them valuation experts, who try and not say, I know when things are going to turn around, but they say, I know when something is cheap. Now, both of these types of investors uh, believe that they are right and that the market is wrong. In other words, the market is mispriced and their definition of what is a good company is correct. Now, they will always buy shares they like. Now, there's a third type of uh, investor that uh, has become over the last 15 years quite uh, popular in terms of global research and that is the sort of, they call behaviorists. In other words, they say you should never buy the share you like because you should rather buy the share that the market likes. And they're saying that the market is actually not as stupid as we think it is. And there are things in the market that are irrational. In other words, they don't believe in efficient markets, but they say that the market is, a, is this sentiment-driven animal. And you need to rather look at what everyone else likes rather than what you like. Mm -hmm. uh, Linda, let's get your thoughts on those uh, three types of investors and the emergence of someone who's really uh, trying to work with the market as opposed to uh, you know, second-guessing it. And then let's just get also your views on uh, how wrong analysts and forecasters can get it. Well, the first thing I would say is that as value investors, we disagree entirely with that last category of investors which Roland spoke about, um, the type that goes with the market. And that's really sort of the momentum type strategy. We would say that actually going with with the herd um, is not safe. You know, that safety in numbers analogy does not apply to investment markets. If you try to follow what everyone else likes, you will end up losing capital. You will make permanent capital losses. And why do we say that? Because unfortunately, uh, the market tends to uh, be irrational at both extremes of the market. So the market goes from you know, the heights of euphoria to the depths of despair. And at the heights of euphoria, if you're buying into a theme or a story which has caused stocks to become 
extraordinarily expensive, buying into that is going to expose you to a huge risk of capital loss from that point onwards. And there's so many examples to list, whether it's the IT bubble, whether it's the super cycle commodity boom uh, in the f just prior to the financial crisis here, w after which resources dropped so strongly. There are numerous examples in, in uh, the markets to show investors that going with the markets might work for a short period of time, but ultimately it's to an investor's detriment. Linda, just a quick question. Surely every investor is a value investor, as in every professional investor says that they buy shares that are cheap. So, uh, you know, how do you differentiate yourself from everyone else in that regard? Because everyone's trying to avoid loss. Everyone's trying to say that I only buy shares that are cheap. That's right. And that is a very important point. Um, Roland, you know, it comes down to how do you come to that value? Uh, so you're quite right. I mean, there's no one out there saying, I think this is way uh, too expensive, but I'm hoping that'll continue and I'm going to buy into it for the moment. Um, everybody puts a value on a stock and says, I think that it's undervalued. Um, coming to that value is really what separates true value investors from the rest of the market and it's got to do with that concept of forecasting. So most of the market is trying to guess what market prices are going to do. They actually don't really care too much about the underlying value of that business. What they're trying to guess is what is the market going to be prepared to pay for this business at any point in time. And often in trying to do that they use uh, forecasts of revenue one to two years out, etc. Um, and we know from the evidence, and my paper talks about this, that they are terrible at forecasting. Even one year out, I they mean, get it right only half of the time. Linda, we've got that um, graph up on the screen from your paper. So just so that you know, um, you know, it just shows how yes. bad forecasting even into that two year period and how much worse it gets uh, the further down the line you look at it. Absolutely. So you can see there that the evidence doesn't suggest that forecasting one to two years out where you're trying to put a hard number on revenue is a good idea. So what we do when we come to a value of a business is we try to say, knowing what we know about this business, its fundamental drivers, how it's done over time through various market environments, we try to say what is a sustainable level of earnings for this business through cycles. So not next year or the year after, through cycles, what is a normal level of earnings for this business? We value your feedback. Send us your emails, questions and comments to wealthquest at abn360.com. You can also go to www.abndigital.com. There you can find our past shows and Quibi's blog. And of course, join us next week as we unpack the second part of our themes. And stay tuned after the break. CNBC